So good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. Um, welcome to webinar four of our series, which we have um, started called Countdown to Canada's Rare Drug Strategy um, for the fall of 2020. And our webinar four is Reimagining Canada's Rare Drug Strategy. And I am really thrilled to have you here. I'm just gonna do a bit of brief introduction, and then we're gonna introduce you to the panelists who have I joined us for what I believe will be a really engaging uh, discussion. Uh, just to uh, briefly kind of go over again, um, there is a question box. We really encourage you to put in your questions throughout uh, the discussion and we will get to them when there are, is a break or when there are questions, um, but put them in throughout the, um, the conversation. Um, and uh, that way we've got some lined up. Uh, we encourage you to definitely take an active role in participating with We've got one more to be in this series, so we're really delighted to be able to just involve it. Those of you who've been with us before, you'll know kind of what the basics of this is. Um, for, for us, it's been the opportunity, as we say, to really take advantage of what we're calling a rare opportunity of a lifetime. As some of you will know, we've had the um, uh, a number of events that have taken place that have brought us to this point. Um, in just this past month, the Patent Medicine Supervisory Review Board came out with their new guidelines, and uh, part of it was hopefully to give us assurances that there would be non-excessive pricing of rare disease drugs. Um, we'll give you a, a head us up um, at the end of this about the webinar um, later today. Most importantly, what has led us to this point was the commitment from the federal government. September 2020, some of you will remember there was a speech from the throne where the government committed once again to an overall rare disease strategy and in part recognizing we believe that optimal drug access is premised on having accurate diagnosis, expert clinical care, and supportive programs. So in order to make sure that we're going to optimize the use and the availability of rare disease drugs, we have to wrap around it an overall strategy that will include all the other components. Importantly, in February 2019, prior to the election, the Canadian government committed $1 billion to setting up a national rare drug, a rare disease drug strategy to be put in place in 2022. So a billion dollars over two years with an ongoing commitment of $500 million each year. Um, this obviously is a huge opportunity, and this is the promise that we're moving toward in this webinar series. In June 2019, many of us participated in uh, Dr. Hoskins' consultations, and um, at the end of that consultation uh, with the uh, PharmaCare report, Dr. Hoskins also recommended a distinct pathway for the consideration of expensive drugs for rare diseases. And within that recommended a national expert panel for patients and their clinicians to determine which rare disease drugs should be funded for which patient. This again, recognizing that rare disease drugs do need to be treated differently under its own pathway, and we believe under its own guidelines of access. Um, those of you who've participating with us know that in November 2018 as well, the Provincial and Territorial Expensive Drugs for Rare Diseases Working Group came out with a very important announcement of, uh, of a supplemental process for managed access to complex specialty drugs, which includes the rare disease drugs, again, separating out from the overall drug pathway a process that would allow us to be able to bring in drugs, but also to bring in drugs under a managed access schemes, which means bring it in drugs, um, oftentimes with early evidence to be able to monitor and to be able to evaluate on a go forth basis, setting up uh, the opportunities again for uh, the collection of real world evidence to be able to improve uh, ongoing access. And in 2018, as well, Health Canada um, as part of their modernization of their drug regulatory process, they introduced or at least um, consolidated a regulatory approach to drug rare diseases for orphan drugs, which is you know, a, a real important pathway that identifies 
um, how they would actually be able to bring in drugs that are designated as orphans elsewhere, but also drugs that would be for small patient populations. So for us, this is in fact a lot of streams coming together to allow us to now really take that challenge in hand to move forward with trying to come up with what we feel could be the very best rare disease drug program in the world. And I don't say that lightly. So this is our countdown. Um, we've had um, three webinars up to now, and I think all of them really, really have been amazingly informative and really raised some, a, lot, a lot of new ideas, which we will take into um, our, our consultations moving forward. This is the fourth one, and we're, it's reimagining Canada's rare drug strategy using the same format that we did um, in a couple of the, in, in, uh, in almost all of these uh, so far, and that is looking at some of the challenging therapies that come in for rare diseases, identifying kind of what worked and what didn't work in our current system, and what do we need to get right if we're going to make these drugs available to patients in a way that's also going to meet the needs for having ongoing assessment, uh, affordability, and availability and accessibility in our system. So how do we get it right? And I think if we can look at some of these challenging therapies, it will help us in terms of setting up the system for, for all of rare disease tragedies, uh, drugs. But I think as many of you will know, most of these drugs coming in are pretty challenging. They are outside of the scope of an ordinary pathway, which is exactly why we need a rare disease drug strategy. So this is our consultations going forward. We will have a national consultation forum. The date actually is December the 16th. Should have put that in there. So December the 16th, you'll get a save the date. Mark your calendar for it. We will have a full day of consultations that we hope will springboard us into what will be happening next year. Consultations from January to June on what we're calling hot topics, pivotal channel challenges, needing to get those addressed if we're going to set up a drug uh, strategy that's going to work for all rare diseases. A series of provincial consultation forums that will take place from January to April, province by province. We want to understand kind of what specific provinces uh, issues are, what the feelings of stakeholders are in those problems, and trying to make sure that we're affecting the provincial jurisdictions there. We'll consolidate that feedback into a single report. We're going to send those out for more public consultations through surveys and focus groups in the summer. With the, op, uh, with the plan that we will have a collaborative document October 2021, we have no illusions that everybody you know, across Canada is gonna sign on to one proposal and, and be all in sync with it, but we believe that we can come up with a collaborative program that will in fact meet the needs of the rare diseases community, but also very importantly, meet the needs of the stakeholders, including the industry and the payers and the policy makers. And we would like to have something that could be ready to go in January 2022. So that's our goal. And this is what this series is all about. So the fourth here is reimagining Canada's drug rare drug strategy. What are the key issues we want to address here? Uh, first of all, what are the challenges that could derail a rare drug program? What And that includes, do we have the, enough evidence and, and in order to make an appropriate um, assessment? Can we come up with something that's going to be affordable? What about making sure it's available in terms of the clinical and other services? What about the reimbursement? Is it going to be reimbursed? How is it going to be reimbursed? Which jurisdictions are reimbursing it? And what are the recommendations then that we need to do in order to unlock this panel? Somehow I seem to miss my panel introduction. Oh no, I don't hear this, of course. The panel here, Fred Little, I'm really delighted, Canada's lead on rare diseases from Pfizer Canada. Really thrilled to have Chris McMaster, who is the scientific director for CHR Institute of Genetics, who wears many hats and plays many, many important roles in our um, rare disease genetics um, environment. Ferg Mills, who's the director of strategic consulting for NMR Strategies, one of the I think really experienced um, consultants and working with bringing in drugs for rare diseases and for other diseases and worked with for, for over many years and nothing but the highest respect for the expertise it brings into this uh, environment. Blaine Penny, who's the CEO of Mito Canada. Blaine is um, a parent, but he's also um, one of the really, I think, the sharp minds um, coming into the rare disease space. And in fact, uh, for us, it was a great opportunity this year to capture him 
um, for our board of directors for court. So we're really delighted that he's um, coming into this session for us as well. So really thanks so much, Blaine, for everything that you're doing for us right across the board. So in order to get us going, um, we've got a number of case studies that we're going to be presenting. Um, what I might do um, really is I'll introduce the case study, recognizing that um, these are backgrounds for the panelists to use and for you to use in consideration of what's working in our system, what needs to change, how are we really going to get a drug system that's going to work for what we call some of the most challenging drugs, because we need to be able to address these as well as uh, many of the uh, other therapies that are already available, many of the other therapies that are going to hopefully be somewhat less challenging, but certainly still require the same kind of a, of a system that we're talking about. So what you'll see is that this is a slight sort of a, not a fictionalization, but a little bit of a lighter touch of, of some actual diseases and drugs. So many of you will recognize uh, the conditions and the drugs that I'm talking about, but we wanted to make sure that we could do it in a easily presentable way. So that we're not strictly tied to the exact details of both the condition and the drug. So the first case study is a neurological disease um, known as LGD. It is um, in LGD, there's a deterioration of the motor neurons, which causes and over time a loss of the ability to speak, to eat, to move, and even to breathe. And many patients do in fact die from uh, respiratory failure. The onset is unknown. Um, at least from the point of view of the absolute origin of it, only uh, though about five to ten percent of the cases are familial, so it's in the family. Age of onset is usually around sixty to seventy-five years. Um, sadly, most um, patients who are diagnosed with this disease will die within two to five years of diagnosis. It affects about three thousand Canadians um, in terms of overall uh, uh, numbers. There's about a thousand new diagnoses every year, um, but also about a thousand deaths each year. Um, until very recently, there's been no real proof therapy for this condition. There is in fact now one drug therapy that is actually indicated for LGD. It, it was originally an infusion drug from Japan and was used for patients recovering from stroke. So to actually improve their neurological functioning in the recovery <laughs> Um, in about the 90s, um, patients began to use it for ALS, uh, for, sorry, for LGD. They were able to, on a personal import basis, bring this drug in themselves um, and to then get somebody to administer it for them um, through lots of, um, I think, pressure, but other um, reasons from the company itself. In 2017, it was approved in the U.S. Though it was approved in Japan for the condition in the nine, uh, in about 2001, 2017 approved in the U.S. In 2018, for the same condition, on the basis of at that time a single placebo control trial over a six-month period for early stage patients, um, with the approval in the U.S. and in Canada, the approval extended to the total population. Um, a follow-up extended trial showed that the benefits uh, uh, remained over a period of a year. It is a challenging drug. It is an infusion uh, uh, treatment, has usually done in hospital, can also be done at home. It is infused daily for about two weeks on and then two weeks off. Um, what we know in the early evidence is that about a third of patients will discontinue use after about six months due to death of the patient, due to no longer um, demonstrated effect or uh, adverse effects. The list price is about $185,000 per year, um, just recognizing that the import price when patients are bringing it in privately, oftentimes from a generic uh, provider as well, is about $5,000. So I'll leave that there and come to the second case. Um, this is a rare cardiovascular condition, which we're calling RLPC. It is a very rare recessive genetic condition characterized by elevated levels of, uh, lipo, uh, of low density lipoprotein cholesterol. It leads to early cardiovascular disease and oftentimes premature death. For patients with this uh, recessive condition, uh, may die between the ages of 20 and 30 years. It is, in fact, very rare. It's maybe one in 150,000 for 300,000 uh, uh, persons, which means about 150 or so Canadians living with the 
in addition. Um, so recently, there is there was no. It was um, managed by having very low fat, low cholesterol diets. Um, statin were used. Another cholesterol uh, inhibitor drug was used, and um, apheresis uh, done on a biweekly basis, where in fact the plasma is um, exchanged. The uh, lipoproteins are taken out, and then uh, returned to the plasma returned to the patients. A very time-consuming process, um, and um, again. All of these combined were not necessarily effective in terms of keeping uh, the cholesterol at a non-life-threatening level. There's therapy, LMP. It actually directly reduces uh, the lipoproteins, and it's used, though, often in conjunction with the other therapies. So you cannot stop the other therapies. Single uh, non-placebo control clinical trials show that LMP significantly reduced cholesterol markers at six months. But there was no link, um, no, both in terms of the actual trials and then follow-up to show that there were any impact on the cardiovascular disease, which obviously is due to the levels of the lipo, uh, uh, low-density lipoprotein cholesterol, but the direct relationship is not shown in any kind of studies. Interestingly, there was a split in terms of the assessment value assessment uh, with one HDA agency approving it and therefore making it available and rejected by the other, citing that there was a lack of evidence and especially the lack of evidence showing that it actually, you know, not that it didn't show a reduction in the biomarkers, but did not show a reduction in terms of the cardiovascular disease. The list price of the therapy is about $380,000 per year. Okay, so I'll leave that there. The panelists have gotten a copy of it, but for you to have in your background, these are the challenges we've got, right? Can we deal with these? What were the uh, challenges here? So the questions for discussions, and I'll start with, uh, you know, we'll, we'll put them all up there, but I'll start with the first one. How would you evaluate the way in which our current drug system manages access to these very challenging therapies? Do you feel the right patients are getting access under the right conditions? What is working and what is not working? With that, I'm going to take stop showing my screen and hopefully she'll go to our panelists. Ask the panelists to consider this first question and start by introducing themselves in them as they're addressing this question. So if I can figure out how to stop sharing my screen. There we go. We have uh, three of our other panelists on the screen. Our fourth panelist is not really shy. We just couldn't figure out how to get his camera working, but he is definitely here with us. Uh, so just to introduce again, Fred Little, uh, for Mills, Chris McMaster, and off screen somewhere, Blaine Cough, if you hear us, Blaine Penny. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you very <laughs> much, Blaine. Appreciate it so much. Blaine is actually more attractive than any one of these three guys. So I'm really uh, <laughs> sorry that you don't get to see him. <laughs> That's all right. Well, it's I, not I, a high I, it's not a high <laughs> bar. <laughs> and I prefer to see other people's faces than my own. So this is working out just fine. <laughs> Okay, I, you know, uh, maybe if you don't mind, Fred, I'm going to punt it to you. Uh, introduce yourself, and uh, if you can address that question, it's a big question, so we can address it in whatever we want. What's working? We've got these very challenging therapies, and you can see some of the newest answers on there. Did, did we get it right? Is it working, or, or are we really lacking in terms of being able to get these critical therapies? Fred. Well, bless you, Chris. Thanks, uh, Thank you. Duran. Uh, Fred Little, uh, I'm the country lead for rare disease uh, for Pfizer uh, Canada. Uh, very happy to be here today. So looking at both case studies, I suppose maybe I'll, I'll uh, kick it off uh, this way. Uh, there's the adage, you know, how do you uh, eat an elephant? It's one bite at a time. So I think the first bite I'd like to kick off with is, you know, both of these particularly show that uh, patients are at need for, for the medication. And the longer they wait, unfortunately, they run into very extreme uh, situations and unfortunately in some cases death so really time is of the essence i think one of the things that we have already in canada i mean there is a commitment uh, to do our best to have drugs reimbursed uh, as quickly as possible uh, in some cases in regulatory framework um, already canada and health canada are looking at uh, parallel reviews. Uh, it's not for all medications, but it's for some. And I know in this case, in both of these, that wasn't an option. So there is time between the regulatory approval and then uh, the HDA assessment, and then also negotiations with provinces, and then uh, the medication to get in the hand. 
So I think one of the things about reimagine, so if we kind of look at reimagining the system, I mean, there are some jurisdictions throughout the world, and I'm looking at Germany as an illustration where, you know, they put together a process that allows medications, there is an assessment up front very quickly, that allows for a period of time that's up to 13 months, so that medications are paid by the, by the, uh, the payer in Germany. Uh, patients can get access, and then at the end of that 13-month period, uh, again, there is a uh, there is a an assessment, uh, a health technology assessment, and then they enter into the negotiations with the uh, manufacturer to come up with what to define overlap of the the uh, the payer as well as uh, uh, the manufacturer around around value. So I think when I look at both of those, if that were available here in Canada. To me, the first thing is patients who really need it would be getting medications right away and then putting what is also equally important because I mean, these medications would be paid for, but putting the payment piece into another framework that then can be evaluated in parallel or at a different, uh, at a different time. So I think these are the two perspectives I suppose I would like to bring when you tee up their hands, reimagining right because this has already happened uh, and we could pick holes but then if this were to happen today and we were to take that one billion dollars that you're talking about and reimagine the framework what would good really look like and uh, this is one thing i would uh, put out there uh, on the table brilliant so we could actually have some form of a almost a kitty where we've got the um the funds that could be made immediately available pending final negotiations that would allow us to to catch those patients because you know, in both of these cases, right, these are life-threatening conditions. So if we wait, we would definitely lose some of those patients. Okay, Ferg, I'm glad you came back because I'm going to turn to you. <laughs> Introduce yourself and uh, if you can kind of follow up or expand on what Ferg said, tell us if you agree. So uh, my name is Ferg Mills. I'm a health economist by training. Um, most of the work that I do is involved in uh, submitting reimbursement dossiers to Ines and CADF and, and dealing with provincial payers and um, uh, private payers as well and increasingly of course negotiating deals with with uh, private payers as well as public payers uh, so i think what fred pointed out about the german system is a, a very interesting model that would of course be quite a sea change for the way drugs are particularly reimbursed in canada um, the question really though is whether we're getting it right right now and i think in a sense we kind of have a lowest common denominator approach when it comes to the cataf you know, range of, of um, participating jurisdictions, just because there are so many stakeholders involved. On the other hand, we can compare that with INES, where, you know, there's only one, there's a much tighter community of stakeholders involved. They have a lot of input into the process. And I think very importantly, when we're thinking about these two examples, really the, the, the key is that one had an acceptable level of uncertainty attached to it, which is the, the neurological disease. There's a level of uncertainty there that if you if you look back at what has happened in that disease, they conducted a trial that was kind of very broad and had a lot of different types of patients at different stages of their disease. And that, that trial was not successful. So they identified a subgroup within that trial and conducted another trial, which was successful. And ultimately, CADF, when they looked at that information, was very supportive because they recognized the amazing unmet need in this disease. Um, and they went where the unmet need lay, um, but where the evidence could support its use. Um, so, you know, INEX did very much the same thing. On the second one, they were asked to make a decision on the basis of 29 patients reporting six months of data in a lifetime chronic condition you know, on the basis of a surrogate marker that hasn't been clearly established to have a, an impact on the, the outcomes that they really value, meaning cardiovascular events, cerebrovascular events, et cetera. Um, and so the uncertainty was just too great for them to accept. Conversely, though, INES has an institutional mandate to accept promising drugs and to err on the side of access rather than, you know, parsimony or, or economy, let's say. Um, and so their attitude at INES, and we see a couple of the good examples of this, is to um, you know, provide access and allow data to be collected and allow the uncertainty to be reduced over time, uh, which I think is an excellent model, what commonly referred to as sort of managed uh, access or managed entry programs. Uh, and they're doing a, a very sort of you know, crude version of that. It's not that it's not clear what information should be collected, et cetera. But, but the, the important thing is that 
Ines has decided that they want to be a center of life sciences activity. And they recognize that to accomplish that, they need to invest in the life sciences sector. And part of that is rewarding companies that bring promising new therapies to market, even if the uncertainty is great. If, there, if it shows promise, then we should maybe just get behind it and, and, uh, and fund it. But that's easier to do in a tighter knit community like the one that exists in Quebec, um, where the doctors who specialize in all of these different diseases are very actively involved in Ines's activities. They're very aware and they feel a sense of responsibility towards the healthcare delivery system. Um, and not to say that that isn't true elsewhere, it's just it gets diluted so many, through so many layers of bureaucracy. Um, but I think Ines has, show, has really kind of blazed a trail that other people could follow, other groups could follow um, by having this openness to uncertainty. And that's really what it all comes down to, is uncertainty. Great, so I think you've said some great things to build on what Fred said. So if I get where you're going, um, you know, Ines obviously is a model that, um, as you say, has some real roots in their principles um, and also in their desire to be the kind of uh, life sciences uh, e ecosystem that it has. But it definitely is a model that could be expanded, you know, as a principle for uh, it to be used more broadly. Um, I think based on what Fred said as well, you know, one has the opportunity to say, does it really work for this patient? Yeah, does it work for that population? And let's kind of, re we can take a look again after a year or so. And I think that's an important thing. And we do know a couple of patients that have actually been saved because they are in Quebec. And we know a couple of others that are really struggling because they're not there. So this is kind of proof in terms of what you're saying, you know, with that condition. So this is a huge, huge, um, I mean, it's a real life uh, problem that's going on. So thanks for that perspective. Chris, I'm going to ask you to take a stab at it and you may expand on it or come at it to us from a different perspective. And knowing Chris, he's going to come at it with a totally different perspective that I would not have imagined. So over to you. Thanks, Durhane. Um there's, you know, I'm just in terms of myself. Yeah, I'm I'm the scientific director for CIHR, so Canada's version of NIH is uh, Institute of Genetics. I was a former head of pharmacology at Dalhousie University and assistant dean. I've been an academic, still am, in terms of running a medical research lab that's really gene discovery, drug discovery for inherited diseases. Um, I guess a couple of things from sort of a, a thirty thousand foot perspective to begin with. I think to, to to add to what Ferg was saying, I think um, if we can get approval with post-market monitoring for some of these drugs where you've got six months to a year's worth of data where your biomarkers are trending the right way, but you need years of data to determine if the disease course is going to be changing or not, I think that makes perfect sense. And I think if we can trend towards that type of an approval process, I think it would be very helpful. Um, as, as we've all known, and it's, 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 it's sort of in the speech from the throne as well, moving towards more of a national pharmacare, but maybe national pharmacare for rare diseases could lower some of the provincial barriers as well and get a little bit more homogenization in terms of what we're choosing to pay for or not as a country. But I also think something that Canada could do as a nation that might help um, is if Health Canada could maybe get some reciprocity when it comes to approvals with sort of so-called trusted partners like the FDA or the EMA. So if it's approved there and Health Canada is plugged into the approval process, they're in the room when the discussion takes place, that also might speed up access. And, um, and if they take these trusted partners decisions, you know, because they're there and part of the process as part of um, a way to move forward, that could also speed up the, the, the time and the access for Canadian patients. So, so for me, from sort of a 30,000 foot look, that's one way to do it. And I think another way to do it uh, in terms of, you know, lowering potential costs for some of these drugs, especially if it's a drug repurposing play, which is sort of what uh, case one is, is if it looks like a drug repurposing play, some of the things that may be, make people squeamish is you say it's normally a drug that could be bought for five grand, but now we want to charge 185 grand because we're repurposing it, what the heck's going on? Um, and uh, I do think, you know, we know there's costs associated with, okay, you run the cutter on the clinical trials for a whole brand new disease. It's not free and your market size is really tiny. So it's going to be a lot big cost per patient. Makes perfect sense. But is there a room for perhaps academics and healthcare centers that are already on the ground doing this? They're docs that are being paid. There's funders like CIHR that could fund these smaller size clinical trials that could then lower the 
bar and lower the potential cost for these sort of repurposed drugs versus um, running it entirely through the private sector where you know you've got to absorb all of those costs because my salary is paid by the government a lot of clinician salaries in Canada are paid by the government the infrastructure is already there and paid for so if we're thinking along those lines could there be more of a role for you know the universities university-based hospitals research-based hospitals and clinical trials uh, expertise within those shops to maybe before we stampede towards um, that could be more of a private public sector partnership in terms of trying to get more repurposed drugs through over the hurdle for for rare diseases that might lower the risk for everybody and potentially lower the cost because it's some of it's absorbed by the governments who would be the payers in the long run anyways so those are some of my thoughts on sort of access it's brilliant and certainly i think in canada that could certainly be a niche that we can carve out, right? So where are these drugs? Yeah. Where could they be repurposed or extensions? You know, so yeah. sometimes just doing the, you know, the clinical trial, gathering the evidence around extensions that would allow us to get that drug to a broader uh, population. Um, oftentimes, just a a different version of a uh, of a of a different genetic version of those therapies. We're going to talk about that actually in our last webinar. So, you know. Sure. Uh, Maybe you would stay tuned for that kind of thinking as well. I'm going to move to Blaine, who is off camera, but I know is paying attention to us. Blaine, if you don't mind, um, you know, kind of introduce yourself and you can kind of work off of what you've heard or introduce for us uh, something from the perspective of a parent and, and, and uh, a patient, but also somebody very much involved in terms of advancing the research and access. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And uh, apologies again for not uh, having a visual here, but uh, excellent discussion so far on this topic. And, and as I look at it, uh, maybe I guess a, a quick introduction. So, so my background and connection here is uh, I have a 16 year old son uh, whose name is Evan, and he was diagnosed with a mitochondrial disease when he uh, became very sick at the age of four and was a typical uh, normal kid up until that point. So a very drastic shift, obviously, in his life and health and, and our, our family dynamic. Uh, my professional background, I'm, I'm an engineer by training. Uh, so I look at, uh, I'm a problem solver, I guess. Uh, and uh, and over the last uh, 12 years, uh, we've been trying to solve this problem and realizing there's obviously uh, a lot of other rare diseases with similar problems. So uh, so that's kind of the lens I'm looking through here. And, and over the last 12 years, I've invested a lot of my time with uh, the development of Mito Canada, focusing on mitochondrial disease. And unfortunately, there are no purposely developed drugs for mitochondrial disease, but um, we're getting a lot closer and the pipeline is growing and, and that's very exciting. So when I look at uh, these two case studies and uh, looking at it through the lens of uh, patients and, and as a father of a child uh, with a rare disease, I think we're, we're looking at a delicate balance of, of hope, uh, timeliness, uh, access and cost. And, and Fred uh, touched on a, a couple of things I think that really resonated with me. And when we look at, uh, you know, like the first case study, um, and, you know, it, it's very positive, obviously, that it was approved. Um, and, uh, uh, but again, you know, when there is something approved and available, patients are going to want to get access to it as quick as they can. Because uh, in most of these, you know, situations, time is of the essence. And, uh, and I, I, I can certainly appreciate that, uh, you know, the earlier the intervention, um, uh, you know, a lot of symptoms that are developed from rare diseases, you know, it's, it's tough to reverse them. We, we know that. So that timeliness is critically important. And, and I can tell you, as a parent, um, along this, this journey for us, um, we would have, like, mortgaged our house. We would have given anything to improve the health of, of Evan. And so, so there's, so that's a real, uh, I think a behavioral, a, a real life uh, element uh, for, for patients when, when something is available uh, and they can get access to it, they will, you know, they will throw whatever money they can at it. So when things get uh, caught up into the bureaucracy of, of, of uh, you know, from approval to, uh, to reimbursement, that is that can be like a, a death zone for families in, in the sense of uh, financially. And, and a, the suggestion or the, the example that Fred uh, uh, provided, I, I think, is, is a great example of helping bridge that gap until the health technology assessment can be completed. Uh, so that, that's a, I think that's a great solution. 
And uh, um, and I think the other uh, the other couple of points. I'm just just looking at my notes here. Um, and, and obviously, there's like uh, early. Uh, um, I guess where you have uh, you know limited clinical trials that show promise. I, I think it's it's really important for uh, for patients that are considered to be the best fit for that uh, type of therapy to continue with it to develop more evidence. The evidence is clearly, you know, such an important part here. And if you look at the second case study, um, there is a difference in, in how that evidence was evaluated. So clearly that, that uh, a longer term um, collection of that evidence and, and study information is really important. So, so for me, those are the, the key things that really stand out are, are the timeliness and, and timing uh, to, you know, to, to finding, um, to, to not leaving it to families to to have to foot the bill of that drug uh, in in that short term if there's another uh, alternative way. Great. So we're kind of all coming back to a bit of what um, Brett uh, was starting off with. I'm going to um, hopefully be able to share this screen again. And um, there's a bit of a problem here. Um, I'm going to move you to the next question, or at least, I mean, these are not separate questions. They really are meant to kind of like be a sort of, you know, talking points for us. You know, how do we then, if we're reimagining our rare drug program, you know, um, we do have to have assessments. We have to make sure it's affordable. We've got to make sure that we've got the systems in place so that the therapy would be available. And if we look at both of these therapies, there is some amount of, um, of actual expertise and uh, specific uh, systems that have to be in place and then access through the reimbursement, you know. So is that, you know, what is it that we need to build in then beyond kind of what we've, you've already been talking about, you know, in terms of um, uh, of having, you know, the availability to, to have some kind of a a startup fund, I keep calling it, and certainly I cannot think of a better use for a portion of a billion dollars than to be able to, as Blaine says, have families be able to bypass uh, the concerns of how do I get access to a therapy now that it's been approved. Um, I don't know who wants to take that on. Maybe I could just point, sure. point one thing out, sir. You know, <clears throat> as a health economist, what we're trying to do within, you know, the pharmacoeconomic assessment of drugs is Sure that the well, I guess it's maybe it's uh, hypothetically what we're aiming for is to ensure that the new drug that comes in produces you know the amount of health that we expect to be lost by virtue of the opportunity cost of the the new treatment, right? So I think when we think about a pool of money that's been ring fenced for purposes of funding um, treatments for rare disorders. That's excellent, and I'm so pleased that you know that there's political will to to make that happen now. But I think we still need to be responsible with how we spend that money, and we still need to have a sense of what it is that we're trying to maximize, you know, in terms of uh, health output and um, you know uh, personal dignity and 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 you know the how it is that we really want to sort of measure the the performance of that pool of money, uh, and we still need to think about cost effectiveness within that framework, that is to say that it's not necessarily going to have to you know, achieve $100,000 per quality or something along those lines. I don't think that's uh, realistic at all, and I don't think that should be the objective. But I think we still want some, we still want to maximize something with that first billion dollars that we're going to have available to us uh, in terms of setting up a framework for how we you know, evaluate these new treatments. So there is a, a value assessment that has to take place. Um, and um, I guess part of the question that we all have to come to grips with is, you know, what is that? Is, is, it, is it a value threshold, the way that we've kind of talked about ICERs? Chris, yes. I was just thinking along these lines of, you know, the cost. Um, and, you know, I think absorbing the current costs at the, uh, if we see a large increase in rate for these types of drugs will be very difficult down the road. So can we get the cost down? Um, and I do think the other thing we're thinking about on our end anyways, is if you're looking at most rare diseases are inherited, about 80, 85% are inherited. So single gene disorders, right? And so 7,000 of them, but if you look at how many of them would make commercial sense, you might be looking at 300. So then you got 6,700 left over. 
where you're saying, okay, these don't make commercial sense. What are you going to do for these kids primarily, right? And again, it comes back to, could we take more of an open science approach, an open lab book approach um, that might be shared between academia and industry to try and get some of these small molecules across the goal line? Because a lot of, as I said, a lot of the infrastructure and all of the salaries for academia and clinicians are already being paid for. And these are people that want to do the work. So for these extra 6,700 diseases where there's really no really good you know, commercial set of values that would get you over the goal line. Is that something we could think about? Um, and that would decrease costs. You wouldn't have repetition of data because it's open science. Don't go down this road. Don't try these, this scaffold not going to fly. This target's not going to fly, et cetera. And another thing we could think of, it's if we're thinking into the future with gene therapies, for example, AAV9, let's use as an example. And NIH NCATS has actually got this underway. They're running four different AAV9 therapies for four different inherited diseases, all the way from inception through to the end of clinical trial. And they're gonna pay for the whole thing and they're gonna make all the data, it's gonna be open science and all the data will be available. So that hopefully, and you know, we're talking to Health Canada about this now, if the next, whether it's private sector or um, uh, a foundation or whatever, wants to use AAV9 as their vector of choice over this dose range delivered this way, all of the PKPD add me will probably be identical because it's all the same vector. The only thing you're changing is the cargo, which is the gene. So they'll say you're using AAV9, you're using this dose via this route. You don't have to bother doing any of that stuff. We already know what it is. You just have to maybe do some of the talk studies associated with the only thing you'd change, which would be the gene, which would be the cargo. And that could really speed up cost and, I mean, decrease cost, speed up time. Um, and speed up accessibility for, for folks as well. So that could be a regulatory avenue we could explore as gene therapies start to become more mainstream to, to, to make things more accessible. Great, so it expands a bit on what Berg was also saying about the investment in the innovative sciences ourselves and what can we do here in Canada. Exactly, and could we take some of that 500 million and not spend it all on drugs and maybe take 5%, let's say, and say per year and say we wanna use these ways to try and use an open science or rate or affect regulatory pathways through yeah. science to yeah. move some of these forward. Yeah. We are talking about a rare drug strategy. We're not just talking about a commercial strategy. Fred. Yeah, so just building off of uh, Ferg's and, and some of the points that Chris has made. So I think, you know, one of the challenges of reimagining is how do we, how do we assess value? Um, so the value I suppose I see as, a, as an equation of the now and plus the future, right? So the now is basically the clinical trial or the, the data that's available to make an assessment that goes into an HDA model. And we know the caveat. And sometimes there's challenges. And in this case study, you even see an HDA assessment saying yes and another one saying no. So there is levels of subjectivity within HTA. That in of itself is actually a good thing because it shows that it's not just a mathematical model. So we can get to a structure down the road that actually allows for uh, a health technology assessment that, that can be adjusted to the realities of rare disease. But then we look at the future, and I think the future part is really, and I think this is where the, where the private public industry comes in to play of how we look at value in the long term, is around how do we assess uh, 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 durability and how do we assess efficacy and safety over time for these these either new innovations or repurposed innovations, and we look to you know real world data or we look to outcomes, and the challenges that we find uh, that across Canada I think across the world is what infrastructures are actually in place to be able to collect data, to have that data, or what are the outcomes, and it's a challenge because. You know, the academia really want to do this, but there's budgetary challenges. Uh, the expertise are there, but sometimes getting other people throughout the province or throughout the country or throughout the world to kind of input in. So I suppose, you know, when we're reimagining how we can look at, you know, metrics down the road to be able to then, you know, reevaluate uh, the value that medications and therapies and uh, have, I think trying to put or at least piloting some form of structure, you know, in in rare disease potentially with this investment into uh, you know in place 
uh, because I think if we can get there, we can find a way to collect and then we can pressure test certain metrics for a therapy or for a disease area. It may give us a little bit of a pathway uh, for, other, for other medications as they come in. I know it's not easy, but until we can get sort of an infrastructure in there or a ways of working, uh, it will be very difficult for any payer or any pharmaceutical company to kind of come up with, you know, what is a metric in the real world to be able to look at, you know, am I paying too much or am I not paying enough or what the case may be. So I know it's not an easy and it, the seminar is not to solve for it here, but I think it's one of the challenges that we have, but at the same time, it's one of the opportunities that's before us uh, at the same time. Yeah, and that's perfect because you've really opened up, as you say, a world in which we're going to have, you know, drugs that are coming from a lot of different sources that may actually have, I mean, it's not that different than what's happening right now in terms of COVID vaccines. You've got Moderna and Pfizer that are running neck and neck, you know, one coming out of a nonprofit, you know, kind of more, you know, a research kind of environment that's been trying to, you know, kind of use this technology and another, which is, in fact, a very large pharma company, you know, uh, partnering with another biotech to kind of bring us the therapies. And interestingly enough, I'll, you know, probably at the end of the day, you're going to see both of them being quite successful and available, but probably kind of price it about the same thing, I would think, at the end of the day, because the kind of technology has gone into it. So I think, you know, it's the technology that's going to be driving kind of where some of that um, investment is. But um, at the end of the day, as you say, there has to be a value assessment, which we don't know yet. But I love the idea that we're going to be looking at it from a very, you know, sort of a very different kind of a, a landscape in terms of what drugs are there, including the uh, domestic um, uh, drugs or even the ones that may be partially domestic, as you're talking about in terms of car T's as well, uh, coming out of Calgary that are also going to be manufactured alongside of the commercial ones, the uh, vectors that can be manufactured again in Canada that could be used to deliver uh, some of these gene therapies. I'm going to switch over to Blaine for a second because I know Blaine, Mito Canada, and what you've set up there is a very interesting kind of an enterprise. How would you see it fitting into this mix? And, you know, if we've got uh, therapies coming out of it for mitochondrial diseases? Yeah, I, I think that the points raised uh, are, are really good. And, and some of the things that Chris mentioned were really resonate with me. And, if you, you know, to his point of uh, if there's 6,700 of the 7,000 rare diseases that, that are kind of left over, um, you, you can't throw all the same energy at all of them. And, and I think if we stop and look at what, you know, so again, I step back and I look at it at a macro level. The, the know-how is out there. To, to solve every one of these diseases. It is. Um, if we can solve COVID in whatever, eight months and develop a, like it shows that open source and collaboration at, at, the, um, at the scientific level, we, we, can, we can solve any one of these diseases if we decide it is a priority. Uh, so this is where, and, and to the point of, okay, we've got, you know, 7,000 rare diseases, you know, 80% of them are genetic. Uh, and technology is advancing so fast right now uh, in the you know uh, in terms of uh, diagnostics uh, with next gen sequencing uh, and if we look at uh, you know if we look at three million people who have a rare disease and we say eighty percent of them have um, are, are are genetically inherited that's two point four million people if we had a rare disease uh, a patient registry and we were working with uh, you know, uh, companies such as Deep Genomics that are focusing on artificial intelligence um, to look at uh, at targets. Um, I think that's a real uh, way for us to advance. Uh, but I think that going back to collaboration is really, really important and, and that open open science. I think there's almost just like, <laughs> if you ring fence, you, know, you say 6,700 of these diseases and say any work that's done on these diseases, uh, you know, Thou shalt be open source, and we learn from each other on this, and uh, and you create a whole rule space around rare diseases and and uh, and and openness, because we, we, there's no there, there's not enough resources in the world to tackle all of these uh, the way we traditionally approach other diseases. So I think we need to change the way we look at it, change the way we think about it, but also I think uh, a technology is going to really help us in this space because gene therapies will be such a big part of of future therapies and if we can have uh, 
patient registries that are tracking natural uh, history of, of these diseases, like starting today, uh, we will know so much more about the progression of these diseases. And as new therapies are coming, we'll be able to um, we'll be able to repurpose uh, uh, drugs, and we'll also uh, be able to look at tweaking different types of gene therapies for for similar types of diseases that have have overlap. So well, let me let me toss something at you guys. You guys are really expanding the conversation in many different directions. I'm going to do my last question, but I'm going to pose it in a slightly different form for you in terms of, I mean, um, some of you may know it, that, you know, I also serve as the um, chair of a, a working group um, with the International Research Consortium on Rare Diseases towards global access to rare disease medicine. So how can we get medicines more globally available? I mean, the tragedy is that, you know, fewer than 1% of a rare disease population actually accesses the drugs that are available. I mean, that's a tragedy. You know, and in, in, in many developed countries, fewer than 10% of those that could be eligible actually get access. So this is our challenge. And we know right here in Canada, right? Depending on where you live and what kind of a drug program you might have, you're gonna get access or not. So this is a problem. So if we wanna improve equity, uh, what would you think if we had a buying program, a purchasing program? which would say that, you know, um, whether it's a drug that's coming out through repurposed by one of the, um, you know, more uh, academically kind of nested, uh, research nested consortiums, or whether it's coming out of a commercial firm. And, you know, the agreement was that we, uh, we estimate how many people might actually have that condition and would benefit from the therapy. And uh, we enter into a purchasing agreement. I mean, kind of what we're doing with vaccines right now, right? I mean, COVID's yep. telling us all kinds of things are possible. And I come to you and I say, okay, let's put a purchasing agreement. Man. One of the things this drug, um, pro, uh, rare, rare drug program could do is actually have purchasing agreements that would allow us then to purchase that drug and make it widely available to all the people who would need it, whether we purchase it and purchase a patent or whether we just, you know, purchase it and, you know, and commission it from you. You know, uh, would that be an approach? And I oftentimes say, you know, if you're pricing your drugs because you think you're only going to get, you know, 30, 40 percent of the patient population, I give you a person's agreement. It's going to give you 80 percent, 90 percent of the population. Would that make a difference? Is that an approach? I'm looking at Fred for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like I'm, uh, I'm I'm put on the spot here. No, it's look, it's a uh, it's a very interesting uh, question, uh, Derhan, and I, I suppose again, it kind of goes back to, you know, how how does manufacturers and the payer uh, actually approach, you know, the value of their innovation and utilizing their innovation, and I suppose that right now, while the system ha the system in Canada, you know, has challenges, um, if you kind of look out, put put timing and timelines aside. Uh, there is there is some positive. So to the point that you're making, I mean, manufacturers do enter into negotiations with, you know, with the payer. So whether it's let's say PCPA as a, as an illustration. So we enter in there. Most of the manufacturers, for the most part, do have to submit budget impact analysis, sort of give an idea of where they expect the amount of the population being treated, uh, and also, you know, what it comes up to be a list price. The other positive about, I think, the Canadian system, at least right now, it is it does allow put list uh, list price aside because you know fair, fairly few people will actually pay the actual list price depending on the segment of the population that you're in. So you do get into a negotiation of value, and I suppose the question is, you know, when you enter into that negotiation of value, um, if if a medication ends up being uh, actually selected by the payer and, and, and agreed to, then one can assume that, you know, the population that needs to be treated will be treated because there's a lot of caveats that kind of go inside what these agreements would look like. And if it doesn't, then the question is, the, you know, where, where, where did it break down? And I suppose the third point that I would kind of put in there is I think the, the challenge that we have is oftentimes that process ends up being significantly longer than the actual regulatory process itself. So I think if we get into the reimagining, particularly for rare diseases, and you know, is there a way that 
we could look at and maybe select molecules like you've done here to re-engineering back to see where has some of the problems actually existed so that we can put our finger on them so that the next time a medication goes through, whether it's gene therapy, genetic uh, uh, disease, or you know, in some cases like Lou Gehrig's disease that happens and we're still trying to understand why, we could potentially come to solutions that's a lot that's a lot faster. But at the same time, people feel they're getting value for what they're paying for. I know it's not exactly answering the question that you asked, but that's sort of how I see it from a 30,000 feet perspective. I'd love to hear other people's perspective on that. Okay, Chris, I'm gonna give it to you. and We've only got about five minutes left, so. Yeah, I do like the equity angle you're taking there. And, and I think, you know, for me, I'd expand it to be, you know, not what Canada is doing, but what can we do globally to, to match something like this? So I do think if we get both reciprocity um, through the approval process. Um, but then again, if we can, again, get more certainty around and if we do put, put a purchasing agreement in place for, you know, as many countries as we can get covered at once, you know, you could lower the price of the drug because you can get it to more patients and guarantee that. And that might, I think, possibly be a route that could, you know, you'll get the same amount of reimbursement as the inventor, but you can lower the price of the drug because more folks are going to get their hands on it. So I do think that's a good idea, but it would take more <clears throat> international cooperation. But that said, Canada and a bunch of first world countries signed on to buy more vaccine than they need to try and give away to some of the countries that can't afford it as a way to move you know, this forward. So could we take essentially the COVID model and apply it um, to this? And I do like the idea. It's a great idea. Well, it's an interesting notion. I just flashed onto something that probably is not something I should bring into this conversation. It's a, a different conversation, and that is the whole um, uh, uh, strategy right now in the U.S. to try to buy drugs from Canada, uh, which, of course, we all sort of have violent reactions to. But on the other hand, maybe we should take advantage of it. You know, Fred will come to you and say to Pfizer, you know what, we're not just purchasing for Canada. We like to set up a purchase agreement that would give us 50% of the U.S. as well. What price do you want to give us now? And we would distribute it widely for you, right? So we could become that centralized buying, you know, uh, spot for certainly not just us, but and not even just the uh, lower middle income countries, Chris. We should be buying it for the more expensive countries. So I'm only saying that facetiously. This is a very yes. scary thing for us. We do not want to become the purchaser for the for the US but uh, it's an interesting thought as you say though for certainly other countries I mean we've done some of those things with HIV it is something that would be quite valuable and you know and and not that Canada wants to be doing but Canada is part of a consortium to do it would be certainly a very valuable kind of idea especially for some of those therapies that might be homegrown you know so therapies that we could develop in Canada therapies that would be repurposed therapies can we think about them not just for us as you say but what about having a global world we are just about out of time so um, I'm going to give everybody a chance to maybe give me kind of one quick 30, 45 seconds, reimagining Canada's, I'm gonna call, I'm, I'm starting to call it the, the rare drug strategy, I'm dropping the word disease, we don't have to say disease, it's a rare drug strategy, a rare drug program. What would be, you say, would be the single most important thing that would need to be in it, that you would like to see in it, that would make it something that would truly be serving the, uh, the needs in the future? One important big idea that you would like to put into it. I'm going to start with Blaine. You're off camera there, Blaine. I hope you're thinking fast. Yeah, yeah. I, I really like, it. it's a numbers game, right? And and I think we look at the 7,000 diseases. In Canada, there's, you know, some of those, there's maybe only tens. But if you can, at a global level, there's hundreds or maybe thousands. So I, I think we need to look at it as a number game. And I really like the idea of buying power uh, with with greater numbers. So I think more collaboration internationally when it comes to purchasing and access to drugs um, would would really be beneficial. Excellent, thank you. Ferg? Um, well, I think the purpose of the sort of pre-ordering the product is to give commercial certainty, right? Or reduce commercial uncertainty for the manufacturers. And I think the, the key characteristic of the rare disease strategy going forward has to be uncertainty management. So I think embedding uh, data collection into everything that we do and becoming a hub for research around the world uh, is an ama amazing opportunity that we shouldn't uh, should not miss the opportunity to to seize advantage of. Um, so 
but I think that 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 requires a shared responsibility in terms of um, who bears the risk, right? So I don't think we should be agreeing to purchase at full price two years, three years, five years down the road if we don't really know what the clinical benefits look like. So we should be working with manufacturers to to clarify that. And again, it all comes down to value assessment and what is value in this setting. Great. Okay, Chris. I would think, and this is a little different, Durhain, but I think if we're looking at the 500 million per year, let's say ad nauseum, I think if we hived off 5% to try and find innovative solutions through an open science approach um, for, you know, these 7,000 inherited diseases plus another thousand, you know, non-inherited essentially, um, <clears throat> that would essentially run everything as best we can, you know, and hopefully through public-private partnerships. Because I, I, I agree with you, Fred, one of the most annoying things about public-private partnerships is the uncertainty on the public side in terms of funding and length of funding. But if we had that certainty in place, it would really enable public-private partnerships to actually happen on an open science front to move a lot more therapies over the goal line. So I think if we called it the 5% solution or whatever you want, out of this 500 million, hopefully the provinces would buy in to saying, okay, we, we can understand that a lot of this money will go to help us with the immediate problem, but we see that there's these folks wanting to work together to sort of <clears throat> help out mostly kids with these inherited diseases, rare diseases, and uh, get more medicines over the goal line cheaper. This is brilliant. It really brings us into a whole different space. And Fred, the last to you. Yes, I would say this, Duran. You know, if I look at the last three decades, the first decade was a cardiovascular decade. Then the second was biologics. And now I think we have the opportunity that this decade, you know, we're actually with rare disease being in the rare disease framework in front of uh, the Canadian uh, governments, whether it's the rest of Canada or Quebec. So I just hope that when we reimagine, we can come up with a framework that's actually for rare disease uh, and will help rare uh, patients suffering from rare diseases as opposed to a tinkering, uh, you know, of the current system. So let's make this this decade of uh, a rare disease framework that's rare for us. So that would be uh, my my two cents. Well, I really want to thank all of you. You've really, really allowed us to expand our thinking uh, way beyond, as you say, how do we tinker with the system to kind of just provide sort of incrementally faster or, you know, broader access. So, you know, and we weren't, I mean, certainly price is a big factor, value is still a big factor, but I really appreciate the way you've been able to expand it and also the kind of stakeholders that we can bring in. So thank you to everybody who participated in, um, in this uh, webinar. As usual, the webinar will be available in about 24 hours on a, um, through our YouTube channel and also the slides will be made available. We've got one more in this series which will be taking place um, two weeks from now and then I really want to invite you all to think about joining us on the 16th of December for our one day kickoff on uh, designing a blueprint for Canada's rare drug strategy. So thanks again to our to our wonderful panelists here. Huge thanks to Bill Dempster and 360 for providing the um, the uh, support to, to making this happen. And uh, we will talk to you again very soon. If you have any other questions or want to address us, please feel free to do so. Thank you again. Thank you, folks. And thank you. Thank Jared. you.